Back when I was like six, or maybe seven thirty years ago, I was an unknown predator as a child. Lived in a trailer park so during the summer, it was literally Lord of the Flies from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One day, while me and a friend were snooping around people's yards, we found a rowboat behind a shed. The thing was rotted, falling apart, and just not fit for use. But my friend got all excited and said he knew where a lake was we could go sailing at. So we grabbed some skateboards and two by fours for oars and proceeded to stead the boat. It took four hours of dragging it, and another two hours of moving it though swamp and forest. But we get to the lake my friend was talking about. To us it was a lake, but really just a pond. We're excited about a job well done and just throw everything into the boat and start rowing out with the two by fours. We get out to the middle of the pond and we started to realize we're taking on water, lots of water and fast. We start to panic because we can't scoop out water faster. Then it's leaking in when suddenly we hear a hollow dumum and scratching sound. The boat was sitting on something and we were no longer sinking but still taking on water. We take off our shirts, socks and stuff them into spots. We could see water leaking in and finally relax. We can get water out faster than it was coming in. It was then we had a chance to take in the surroundings. It was pretty awesome for a six-year-old, and we're talking about six-year-old stuff for a few minutes, and then I looked down into the water. It was really clear and seemed deep, and then I realized what I could see and what we were stuck on. In the pond we could see hundreds of 50-gallon metal barrels. They were piled up so high in some places the boat had gotten stuck on one of them. It was like looking into an alien world with mountains of barrels everywhere. I think I had just seen Return of the Living Dead, which starts with kids opening a 50-gallon barrel and releasing the undead I think so I was freaking out and tell my friend we need to get out fast. So we're panicking and getting water out of the boat, and then my friend screams and points down the road, and we both see something worse than undead zombies. The trailer park manager in his truck, flying down a dirt road near the pond and coming right for us. Now it might not sound like much, but this was the guy who got you in serious trouble. Trailer park parents generally didn't care what the kids did, but when he shows up to your house to threaten your parents with being kicked out because of what your kid did, you knew you were in for a memorable beating. He pulled up near the pond and were trying to row away from him, but we were starting to sink again. He grabbed a rope and threw it out to us and pulled us in. We were terrified. We knew we were in for some serious screaming from him and beating from our parents. But he didn't scream, didn't threaten. He just stood there staring at us. He asked us what the hell we were doing out there, that we were trespassing, stealing, and what we were doing was wrong. But not screaming. He was calm, kind of scared, like we got him in trouble. We explained what we were doing there, but didn't bring up seeing the barrels. He questioned us forever we were six, and then told us he wouldn't tell our parents, which was crazy because he told parents everything he saw and would bring us home if we agreed to never go out there again, and to not tell our parents, otherwise he would tell them about all the crimes we committed. He dropped us off back in the park, and we never heard anything about it again. One thing that did change was he never was mean to the two of us again, but was a bastard to every other kid. He never told our parents about anything we did wrong, and was never mean or threatening to myself or my friend again. My uncle saw a skinwalker. So as I said this happened to my uncle when he was about my age, I'd say early 20s, maybe 18 or 19. Must have been the 70s in that case. He was out in the Wyoming wilderness tending to a ranch house. Just him and his girlfriend. The owner was out and had him go up to take care of the animals until he came back. A few days in and everything was well. Animals well, uncle well. He decides to retire for the night. Goes in the cabin with his girlfriend. Sun goes down, they pass out. Uncle wakes up to the pitch black and this horrific hypnagogic scream. 
It was one of those things, he later recalls, that he hoped he had only dreamed. So he lays there for a bit. Things seem okay. Girlfriend doesn't stir. Tries to drift back off. But before he can another one comes. This time undeniably real. Girlfriend wakes and the dog started barking. My uncle gets up and grabs the shotgun. Heads for the door, but realizes the scream isn't alone this time. Another voice chimes in. Then another, to eventually form what he would later describe as a little chorus of suffering. He starts to back away slowly from the door. And that's when the chanting started. Listening to him tell the story, you'd almost start laughing at this point, unless you were really looking on him, because he was dead serious and full of all those little micro-expressions that happen as you really recall something. He could hear their footsteps creak up and down the small wooden porch of the cabin, the chanting from multiple voices, multiple footsteps. By this time, him and his girlfriend are in a shadow in the corner of the cabin, away from the windows and the light of the fireplace, shotgun leveled at the door. He says it felt like forever, animals screaming, them chanting, him shaking, girlfriend crying. In hindsight, it must have only been 30 minutes or so. Then it all stopped. Not all at once, though. One by one, the barking stopped. One by one, the screams stopped. Until the last one. With which the footsteps and chanting came to an end. My uncle sat huddled in the corner, though, for several hours. Eventually, the sky started to brighten with that morning blue against the silhouette of the pines. He waited a while longer, until the sun crept over the mountain range, before making his way to the window. He had an idea of what he'd see. He'd hunted big game and small game, but this was different. The porch was empty, but the cabin ground weren't. He peeked his shotgun out the front door slowly opened it. There in the morning sun, a nice cool morning, he recalls, birds chirping, air fresh. The ground was strewn with dead animals. Blood everywhere. Everything dead and dissected. Guts and organs strewn about. He puked right there on the porch when the smell hit him. Regaining his composure, he made his way around the animals. An odd detail, he thought in retrospect, were the rubber bands tied around the testicles of some of them. He'd seen enough. Him and his girlfriend noped the F out. They made it to town, called the police and the owner. Not sure what came of it. He gets visibly shaken to this day just when it's mentioned. He says he thinks it was those skinwalkers, but he's a superstitious backwoods hick more or less. I live in Portland, Oregon, but I work at Mount Rainier National Park as a backcountry ranger. I would like to remain anonymous, so please refrain from including my name. On the night of the 5th of September 2015, I was driving home from work after a busy day of trail maintenance on the Ara Loop. I was about 15 miles east of Paradise at about 1.30 a.m., and I was doing about 50 miles per hour. I was driving on the Lewis River Road. It was a beautiful night, and I was enjoying the drive. I had my headlights on high beam and was watching my mirrors to avoid deer, as they frequent this area, and in the past, I've nearly totaled my car in the winter when a large buck jumped out. As I rendered the corner coming out of the forest, I noticed a large dark figure on the side of the road. Now immediately I'm on edge because in my mind, I'm imagining this being a large buck about to jump out from my car, and I could not afford the time to make another car payment. I immediately slam on my brakes because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, and I realized it was not a deer because this thing was standing beside a tree on the road's shoulder. So I slowed down even more. I began to focus what little eyesight I had on this creature, and I could see that it was very, very large, probably about eight feet tall, covered in shaggy long hair that looked very thick and matted. It was hard to tell in the lighting conditions and shadows any real details of the face, but I could tell that it turned to look at me directly, and then stopped and stepped off the road into the field. It was obviously aware of my presence and did not seem surprised by me. 
They continued to walk away from the road into the field, lumbering on two legs. I'm telling you now it was not a bear because it never walked like one. It reminded me of a person on two legs the entire time, the comfortability of bipedally walking. It walked for about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, before I could not see it anymore. I was in shock, to say the least. I drove very slowly for a minute to see if maybe I could see it again, but I eventually lost sight of it. Even though I was in shock, I did not feel too scared. I did not feel threatened. I was just in total awe at what I just saw. It was so huge and very obviously not a bear or a person in a suit. Why would somebody be out here in the middle of nowhere? It also walked very naturally on two legs. I went back to the spot the next day and measured a tree it was standing beside. That's how I know it was around eight and a half feet tall. I've been a park ranger for the better half of eight years now and have never seen anything like this before in my life. I have had other interesting experiences though in the backcountry, but they were mostly while working and related to the environment. People are always throwing around the term Bigfoot, but I have no idea what this was. I'm ignorant, please excuse me, and thank you for your time. If you can provide any information, that would be most helpful. Thank you again. May of 1985, we were dispatched to a rural area of Placer County, California, investigating some possible dog or livestock killings. The crime was that the owners found their dogs dead in the backyard, and one of their goats was taken from the pen and killed, pulled apart like a piece of chicken. What was strange about this is that any animal abducting goats or hens would generally eat on them, not take their prey and pull them apart and leave the body. When we got there at first, we saw nothing, but when we began to walk around by our cars, we could hear something, something breathing pretty heavily, like it was running and getting closer. So we walked around some more and could see what looked like a little person hiding behind two trees, just about 50 yards out, looking at us. My partner actually recognized it at first, that it looked like a human face or maybe a child, but with glowing eyes, crouching down and covered in hair. Then it crouched down all fours and ran away into another tree. I was already shooting at it with my 9mm. It did not move like a human, but like that of an animal. That is when it came out of the tree and was on top of me. The rest of the incident is kind of blurry. However, I do know that nobody could find the bullet casings or even see what I had been firing my weapon. I then took them to where the creature was standing when it ran across the road. They still could find nothing. The people who worked on the case were stunned by what happened. One man said he would later go back there again if need be. He also claimed that he had been feeling something evil in the area for a while now. Take that as far as you want. Later on down the road, we also found some dead cattle in another part of the county. We were told by the owner that he had been having problems with some cattle mutilations and thought that this something that I had shot at was also killing his livestock. I know it was not the same thing because the killings were different. Another man who we spoke to had said that this goat that was killed had its stomach completely ripped open just like the others, left there to rot. My report and statement were only taken so far. With this creature having jumped on top of me, I'm surprised it did not kill me, but it did give me some pretty severe trauma that I have to live with. I can tell you that whatever this thing was, it was not a normal human or an animal. This was something else altogether maybe an unknown species of some kind, something that science probably will deny. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I know I used to see as a teenager. A gnome. It wouldn't have even been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard. He was a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the windowsill outside. 
I'd sometimes even see his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. My parents, obviously, always brushed it off as silly crap kids say when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly, or Awa oh, did you? They never paid it any attention, and why would they? I even remember my father saying something to mum like, We don't even have a garden gnome. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there until I was about 18 or 19, and I don't even think anyone in our street owned garden gnomes at all. It never even once looked at me, like he didn't know I was watching, or perhaps didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I'd never spoken about it to anyone but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked mum, she still remembers me talking about him when I was little. Most people reading will probably think what a load, but I promise this is true. Was he real? Or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind? Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff? Has anyone else ever seen one? This happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. I spend a lot of time in Africa both on business and for pleasure. One time there were about eight of us that went camping in a national park in Zambia. I was with a friend and the other six I did not know. There were two other couples and two single females. We spent the afternoon getting to know each other and pitching our tents, had our dinner and retired to our tents for sleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning I hear the two females freaking out. There was screaming like I have never heard before. To be honest, I was shitting myself. I thought some animal was attacking them. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I always remember hearing that when people are screaming they are okay, it's generally the quiet ones that you should worry about. So I got my torch and found the courage to open up my tent. At this point the screaming was continuing, and I could now hear scratching noises. The other members of the group were remaining very quiet. I am sure they were just dry-mouthed and did not want to bring attention to their tents. I slowly opened the tent and shone the torch in the direction of the girl's tent, and I saw two hyenas walking around the tent. I know that generally hyenas are generally timid creatures around humans, but they have been known to attack and kill people in rare circumstances. By this time, the guide was out of his tent and simply shouted at the hyenas and they ran off. One of the golden rules of camping in the domain of wild animals is not to keep any food around. Always keep food in sealed containers and make sure everything is clean and washed properly. It turned out that one of the girls has some biltong dried meat in the tent, and the hyenas has smelt it and were trying to get at it. This happened quite a time ago, but remember the encounter very well. My mom sent me next door to my grandma's to get something for her, when the whole time felt like I was being watched, and looked over my shoulder several times. Now the distance between my house and my grandma's was long enough. Where once I reached my grandma's my home was not visible. The sighting occurred on my way back home. I was about halfway when I saw the creature. It was making a lot of noise and came crashing out of the tree line, breaking a huge tree branch. Then it began to run toward me. I remember thinking this can't be happening. I felt like my legs would not move out of fear. It all was in a time span of 5 to 10 seconds. I then ran the rest of the way home, and I tell you I have never ran so fast. The next day I took my mom to the site where the creature had come out of the trees and showed her the tree branch. Lots of people I know do not believe in Bigfoot, so I normally would shy away from telling my story. I do know for a fact that what I saw was indeed Bigfoot. Okay, so I'll try to make this relatively short, so I'm not one for believing too much of cryptid lore never had an encounter before or anything like that, but my partner and I live on the border of upstate New York, not far from the Whitehall Bigfoot area. One night partner was taking out the garbage and came back inside startled, I mean really shook up. 
They said they had seen a creature that looked like maybe a fox or coyote, but that it then stood up on its hind legs, and so they booked it back inside. Fast forward about a month, and I'm outside on my porch, smoking a cigarette, enjoying the stars under a crystal clear sky. We have a small plot next to our house that has a tow behind landscaping trailer permanently parked on it about 20-ish feet away from the house. After a while of standing outside I get the sudden and intense feeling like something is watching me. Just that primal feeling of danger. It should be noted that, like most people up here, I'm usually carrying a gun on me coyotes and bears are fairly common up here, so I kind of do the four corners check of my surroundings. When I looked over to that trailer, I saw there was something the size of a large dog laying in the grass. Mind you, it's a clear night with a not quite full moon, and the grass was uncut long, but not like a meadow. If I had to estimate, I'd say seven, nine inches high. So I had a really good view of this thing. Now I know never to approach a random animal bedded down at night, so I just kind of watch it for a second. Even in the light of the moon, its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before, unnaturally contrasting against the ground it laid on. Then it looks up, it has piercing red eyes. I'm thinking, aw, oh, what the F, and put my hand on my revolver. I ain't about to be coyote food. And then, it stood up. It stood up on its hind legs. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat-human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm six foot one. It didn't even need to take a step. I flicked whatever was left of my cigarette and backed away to the door, locked and bolted it, and spent the rest of the night wondering what I just saw. Now I'll admit, I'm a religious man, but that thing didn't fit the description of any djinn I've heard of. It's to this day one of the few things in my life I cannot explain we've installed security cameras since but now the lot is under construction and we haven't seen it since. I don't know what I saw that night truly, but I intend to find out one way or another. I want to go into the forest near the plot and look for signs. Does anyone have any advice on hunting this sort of cryptid? I'll update with any further happenings should they appear again. Me and like 10 of my friends went to an abandoned mental hospital in Detroit. We just stood way back and threw rocks at it for a while, while one of us worked up the courage to actually go inside. We constantly are seeing things move in the windows of the building and small lights moving and turning on and off, but eventually half of us say F it, and find the safest way in. We go through where the trucks used to unload into the building and walk down a long hallway. There's a stairwell nearby where we walked in and I heard voices in the stairwell, and no one else heard it but me and my best friend, so we kept moving. We take a couple more turns, stopping occasionally because someone heard something, when soon we come across the most dreaded place we could have found, the morgue cremation room. Tons of graffiti everywhere saying stupid teenager scare tactic shit. Everyone shit themselves when we found that room, but we all chilled in it for a while until we inevitably started to leave. As we leave the morgue it takes you into a hallway where the elevator shafts are, and there is a room across from the door we exit and me and my friend are walking out first when suddenly a girl in a white nightgown steps out from the door across hall and I shit myself. Hoping to cut the silence and maybe get her to react because I was thinking she was like a crazy homeless crack addict I yelled oh shit and she just stood there. Soon after another guy comes out, then another guy, then another girl whose looks made me think they were actually doing heroin. Collectively, we all just went, what the F, and started talking. They told us to put our weapons down because cops go in there all the time and you're not supposed to be on the property, let alone with weapons. But we just had like scrap metal from the ground. So we put our weapons down and talked to the other group for a second while I was talking to the nightgown girl and the ringleader I noticed the cracked out looking one just walk away into the pitch blackness of the corridor behind her, 
while we all had flashlights, which the kid told us to put those off too. But F that idea. We leave, and as we get on the road back to our cars, surprise, surprise, a cop pulls into the road, and we all hid at that point. It was just a couple of us, since some were farther ahead and had made it back to their cars while the cop searched the area with his spotlight. That was a crazy or creepy night. Oh, and later that night at like 5 a.m., a dude followed me in his truck, cause me and my friends fell asleep in my car across the street from his driveway. So he just shined his brights into my car for like 10 minutes, while we tripped out to see if he was gonna do anything. Plus, we were high and tired, thus very confused. Once I had stopped at a gas station and got out, they pulled up to the pump behind me and just stayed in their truck. I walked inside to pay for gas, came back out to talk to the truck guys, but they left as I was walking out. My master's degree work was looking at stoneflies in coastal Alabama, and it required a lot sampling out in the streams, the habitat for juvenile stoneflies around Mobile Bay. When I went sampling, I'd have to get into the stream and collect five packets of leaves that collected in the stream at random intervals in a 100-meter stretch of the stream. I sampled from June 2012 through July 2013 for two different projects, one that used the same four streams for an entire year, and another project that used about 20 different streams in the fall and spring season. When I went sampling, I parked an old Ford Econolean van with a big university sticker won it by the side of the road, near a bridge, then climb down and hop in the stream and go to work. With these streams being out in the woods and some of them being damn remote, creepy stuff happened every so often from metal scrappers asking for any good finds, a decrepit old baby doll in the woods, walking up on a dog grave site under a bridge, a truck stopping on the bridge of a 30-meter wide river terrible place to sample for my work, by the way, and watching me and my sampling partner from a distance, and so many other things I could keep going on, but this is the time I truly felt I was going to die. At the beginning of my field work in the summer, it was easy to coordinate with lab mates to get a sampling partner to make the work easier and safer, but late in the fall to the 12th semester, my main sampling partner had finished her thesis and didn't come to campus much can't blame her, so I started sampling by myself in later November or early December. It added some extra time onto my day, but it made scheduling easier and more consistent and nothing dangerous had happened going solo, so I was good with the change. It was the early spring of 2013 and I was traveling to the second stream of the day hitting a stream I'd seen twice a month for the last seven or eight months. I knew it like the back of my hand and thought I'd seen everything it had to offer. I rolled up about 10 a.m., munching on an apple I had started when I left the previous stream and tossed the apple core into the clearing that I had parked the van in. This stream had a nice clearing off the side of the road, but was a 30 meter or so walk to the stream with a slight decline over eroded dirt and gravel so I couldn't see the other side of the stream. I blissfully rolled up my trusty, punctured chest waders and walked to the trunk, packed up my gear, grabbed my subber sampler, a fine mesh net that attaches to a folding base and metal meter stick. I casually strolled down to the stream ready to take my usual piss under the bridge as I do at every stream when across the stream I see a dog. I think it is a border collegerman shepherd mix, but I am not that great with dog breeds. I stop in my tracks, staring at it, waiting to see if its owner will show up from the woods, but mostly debating if I could still piss, but the dog takes the first move. It makes a loud, solitary bark, and then runs off into the woods downstream. It promptly returns, but it isn't alone. There is another identical dog with it. They don't make any noise. They just stand attentively on the other side of stream, staring at me. I can't make out any collars around their neck, but they had a lot of fur there is about 20 meters separating us since neither of us are that close to the stream bank. The stream bank is relatively high from the water, about 2-3 meters where the standoff happened, and I was on the side with a small steep entrance so I figured I could get my work done and the dogs would leave me alone. 
As I'm climbing down, they are mirroring my distance into the stream, but not getting closer to the edge of the stream. I check over my shoulder to still seem them watching me from the clearing, and still think I'm fine so I start walking upstream. The dogs keep following me, but now they enter the forest. These dogs were not frolicking around the woods. They hunched down, hid behind trees and foliage to conceal themselves, and were dead silent. I couldn't hear them move over the sound of the stream. This is when I am proper spooked. As I kept going and they kept following me, I started to move closer to the opposite bank as often as could and was walking slower than usual in the shifting sands and rushing water, making sure that I didn't lose my footing. Every five meters or so, I would stop to locate them, but there were several times that I lost where they were. I didn't need to see them to feel their eyes out in the woods. Over time, they stopped staying parallel with me and began to stay slightly behind me. After what felt like an eternity, I made it to my fifth sampling spot 95 meters into the stream. Just my luck that day, the longest sampling for the day had wild dogs. I felt a wave of relief since I could now turn around and make my way back to the van, but I had to stay in the stream since the stream banks were still too steep to climb out. The dogs had a different plan. All the way through the stream they stayed together, but now they spilt up. One stayed about three to five meters ahead of me, while the other one was behind me about three to five meters. They hadn't made an advance and were still hiding in the woods, but having one in front and one behind filled me with dread. Walking in, it was easy to keep my back from being exposed and face them, even if I couldn't see them, but now things changed. I turned so I was parallel with the stream banks the dogs were on and began to make my way downstream. The dogs maintained this pattern for about 70 meters before things become decidedly more dangerous. About 20 meters from the clearing, there is a gradual slope that leads to the water on the dog's side of the stream. The dog ahead of me stretches its lead while the one behind me comes down the slope and enter the stream with me. I raise my meter stick towards the dog in the water and my subber sampler net to the dog on the stream bank in front of me and begin to yell. Basically, I look like the science nerd version of the gladiator with the net and trident. I can see the clearing, but my eyes just keep darting from dog to dog and I am slowing backing towards the clearing. The water near the stream dog deepens and luckily for me, it doesn't want to swim for its meal. It runs up the slope and joins its comrades still ahead of me. From here until the gravelly steep slope on my side of the stream, the dogs stay ahead of me hiding in the brush, but never making a move. I scrambled up the slope and starting making my way to the van. The dogs come out of the woods and advance to the edge of the stream bank. I just kept facing them while backing my up to the van. Once I got back to the van, I hurriedly packed everything back up and left before I could eat my lunch at the stream site. I had to return to that stream about eight more times, but I never saw those dogs again. It was the longest two hours of my life. I was driving west on U.S. Highway 2 between the city of Ball Club and Benham, Minnesota. This occurred on March 3, 2019 at around 7.15 p.m. I was approaching a black vehicle, and as I got closer it increased its speed keeping pace with me. I was within 100 yards of the vehicle. It went into the oncoming lane of traffic and accelerated, causing the rear of the vehicle to drop slightly. At that instant, a very large cloud of white smoke filled the highway. I slowed my vehicle and turned toward the shoulder on the north side of the highway. As I went through the cloud, I expected to see the vehicle stopped or black marks on the road. Once I was in the cloud, I could see out, but it was still thick. I watched the ditch on the south side of the highway as well, but saw no evidence of the vehicle leaving the roadway. I expected to smell burnt rubber from the tires skidding or spinning on the highway, but there was no smell. As I came out of the cloud, I could see for a couple of miles as the highway was straight. There were vehicles approaching from some distance to the front, 
but no one going in my direction. I looked in my rearview mirror and there was another vehicle coming around the cloud on the north side also. I wanted to stop that vehicle to see what they saw and thought of the encounter, but I didn't feel comfortable with that knowing how to get them to stop. All I can tell you about the vehicle is that it was a mid-sized black sedan. Nothing special at all about it. I couldn't wrap my head around what I had just seen, and for nearly an hour the hair on my arms stood straight on end. It was a very strange experience. I didn't see it in the air or anything so maybe not connected to a UFO. The only other explanation I can conclude would be spiritual or a ghost if you will. No matter what, I am still very freaked out and bothered by what I witnessed. When I was very young, under 10, my dad would take us to various deer leases for the weekends here in central Texas. There were always cabins of some sort for us to stay in. This one weekend, we went to a lease near Eagle Lake, where there was an old frame house, one-room affair, really, that was at the end of a very windy road. You couldn't see the house until you came right up on it. Well, this one weekend, we came driving out of the oaks only to notice that there was smoke coming from the chimney, trash all over the yard, etc. There weren't any vehicles, though. My dad stopped the truck, got out his rifle, glassed the house for a little while, then decided whoever was there must have cleared out when they heard the truck coming, and seeing as how there was no way we would have missed a vehicle leaving, they must have bugged out on foot. I still have dreams 20 years later about walking into the house to look around. Whoever had been there obviously loved to smoke as there were ashes and cig butts everywhere. Most of the canned goods we stored up there had been eaten, the cans dumped in the yard, and there was a pot of deer corn. Yes, dear corn, boiling on the stove. The thing that has stuck with me over the years was the smell and the open coloring books scattered on the table with crayons dropped in mid-coloring. Out there in the woods was some poor family with at least one kid. I imagined they sat watching us for quite some time before giving up and wandering off. My dad, lacking much sense, decided that we were staying the weekend. Yah didn't sleep much. My hunting partner Ed and I were into the second week of the Oregon bow season. It was about six when we came upon a stock pond. These ponds are fed by a small spring or small creek. We decided to circumnavigate it to see if we could see what was watering in the area. I went left, Ed went to the right. I hadn't gone far when I came to a depression in the muddy, gravely pond edge. It looked like a very big, heavy person had left a footprint there. I got down and saw that there were toe impressions at the front. Well, I called Ed over to see this, and he said there was another one behind the first. We backtracked the prints and found what appeared to be skid marks on the hillside of the pond. This was just next to the small trickle of water which fed the pond. The hair on the back of my neck stood right up. We went up the hill for about 40 yards, but found indistinguishable impressions in the trashy undergrowth. We went back down and tracked them in the other direction, and the impressions overturned pebbles. Broken and bent grasses went about 100 yards down a hill into a ravine thick with manzainta and small scrub oak. We then went back to the foot tracks and covered them with logs so they wouldn't be destroyed went home and got some plaster of Paris. We made the impressions and we were shocked to find that there were definitely toes on one cast, the other was in too much gravel to make a good impression. At the same time I took some pictures of Ed stretching to match the stride of the prince. The next week we went into the same area, same skid road, about 300 yards past the stock tank. We were walking side by side when something to my left and slightly behind us, up the hill approximately 100 yards something caught my eye. I spun around to see what it was, and to my astonishment I saw a pair of legs running into the thick underbrush. I couldn't see all of it because of the trees. My impression was of a two-legged creature animal, with long brown hair on the legs running away from us. Ed saw the branches swinging back into place, but saw nothing else. 
We both got spooked and quickly went back to the truck and never hunted there again. I gave the plaster cast to my nephew in San Jose, California, and have never seen them again. I still have the photos of Ed stretching to match the stride. The footprints measured 18 foot long by 6 across the heel and 8 foot across the ball of the foot. I got some hair samples from a star thistle down in the ravine and I still have them. I have to preface this story by saying that what I'm about to recount is a true story. I know it sounds like something out of a horror movie, but I assure you every word I'm about to share is as real as the road I drive on. My name is Jack, and I've been a trucker for over a decade. I've seen my fair share of strange things on the open road. So it was a usual route for me, driving along a desolate highway late at night. The moon was obscured by heavy clouds, casting an eerie glow over the barren landscape. That's when I saw him, standing on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. The hitchhiker seemed ordinary enough at first glance, dressed in worn-out jeans and a tattered jacket. With a sigh, I decided to offer him a ride. Little did I know that decision would alter the course of my life forever. As the journey progressed, I couldn't shake an unsettling feeling. Strange occurrences began to unfold, and I started to question my decision to pick up this hitchhiker. The air in the cab grew heavy with an otherworldly presence, and I caught glimpses of an unnatural shadow out of the corner of my eye. It was as if the very fabric of reality was shifting around us. Then, without warning, the hitchhiker's face twisted in agony, and he vomited onto the floor of the truck. I immediately pulled over, concern etched across my face. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling with worry. But as I glanced at him, something unfathomable happened. The hitchhiker's body convulsed and contorted in an inhuman manner. His form began to change before my eyes, morphing into a creature that defied all logic. It was a creature I struggled to find words to describe but I'll do my best. It was completely white, bald, impossibly thin, and its humanoid shape lacked any discernible facial features. No eyes, no nose, nothing. It loomed over me, crouched in a position that made its true height difficult to determine. But let me tell you, it was towering at least nine feet tall. Fear coursed through my veins, overpowering any sense of rationality. In a panic, I threw open the door and sprinted as fast as my trembling legs could carry me. I didn't look back. I didn't dare. Only after what felt like an eternity did I finally slow down and catch my breath. But the creature was nowhere in sight. It hadn't followed me. After gathering my wits, I cautiously made my way back to the truck. My heart sank as I realized it was empty as if the hitchhiker and the creature had vanished into thin air. Confusion and dread consumed me. To this day, I can't explain what I saw or what became of the hitchhiker or the creature. All I know is that my encounter that night was undeniably real. Growing up, we had a big house on the water set back a couple acres from the road. Most of the land around us was swamp, and when I was 14 my dog brought up part of a human arm. Mom and I were binging Heroes 2007 and Biscuit got out. We ignored him, and I saw the dog rush past the library window with what looked like a big all fish swinging in his jaw. I go on to bed and she hollers for me and comes to my room wide-eyed. I don't what this is. I go out and it's past the truck and garage in the wide empty space that was there. I shine a light on it and I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing. It's a piece of flesh with three little bones sticking out of one end. My vision does a complete 360 and I curse and look at mom who looks terrified. Ma, you need to call the cops. The police show up, poke it with a stick, then put it in a bag and hold it out the window as they drove to the substation. We later heard reports on CNN about people being cut up and their bodies strewn all along the panhandle. The arm was large and flabby with what looked like a small pox scar. 
Our area used to be a hiding place for criminals and bodies. People used to find corpses in their yards after heavy rains. We even had a guy break out of prison transport and run through our yard in the middle of the night. Gotta love Florida. I was around 15 years old and lived and still living there in the wonderful Bavarian landscape in a small village. As you might know, we in Bavaria are proud of our tradition and our beer. And so we had something what you would call a party or carnival, only for people of our village. As I was the cool boy in our village, I told the other kids what we can play. We played football soccer first, but I got bored and asked my friends if we are going to run around the village and play with our wooden and a friend of mine. Even had a softer, just a weak one, though guns. So we went into barns and and all that stuff and shoot each other. It was great fun. Till one point we were in a barn of an old farmer, but everyone liked him cause he always gave us sweets and told us funny things. He was 83 at that point. One room of the barn was the old slaughter room. When we played in there in front of us was an old door, but it was locked. But I could have sworn I heard something like a quiet clicking. Generally, it was a really old barn and my dad told me that it has some underground tunnels and rooms cause of the World War Roman II. The years did pass and the old man died. His wife died almost ten years ago and the only son and heir decided to demolish the old barn. What they found in the room with the locked door is still kinda a mystery and police and news were all at the place but nobody besides the police and the special teams knew what it was. Later, the newspapers got the information that there was an old bomb of the WW2. But fortunately, my dad helped the son with the work and saw it first together with the son. He never told me till a few months ago. Until that day, only few people knew the real story. He basically built something like a throne of old World War II souvenirs as a national coat of arms and pictures of Austrian painter. There were old radios and medal of Nazis, and a lot of letters in which he wrote about operate behind enemy lines, and in which he wrote to his wife, and that she has to be quiet. In the middle of the room there was the bomb, and it was indeed still ticking, and one of the best obtained bombs of the World War, and is now in a museum. Diffused. No one knew he was that guy. I was so shocked and I can only tell you that people in our village still tell rumors about more tunnels and hidden rooms. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night folks and see you tomorrow at the same time.